Hello and welcome to lecture 10 of the course Microelectronics Lab. In this module, we are going to talk about the automotive uh, probe station for DC and RF uh, test labs and give you a lab demo. Broadly, we'll be covering uh, or giving you an introduction and precautions related to automated probe station setups for DC and RF test. We'll talk about hardware setup and uh, the configuration of uh, automated probe station. Uh, we'll talk about uh, aspects like how to load the sample, create the wafer map, uh, automating the measurement, and finally unloading the sample and shutting down the system uh, before you get to the data analysis. Greetings. Uh, today I'll be showing us how to use the semi-automatic probe station. Uh, like the manual probe station, the semi-automatic probe station too can be used to measure these uh, to perform DC measurements on devices. Um, we also use this setup to do RF measurements. Um, the main advantage of using uh, the semi-automatic probe station over a DC, uh, ma manual probe station is the fact that if we have too many devices, let's say about 100, 200, or many more devices, uh, in that case, uh, individually probing every single device manually would be a very tedious process and would be extremely time consuming. So in order to um, partially automate the process, we can use the semi-automatic probe station, which will remove the extra effort of probing every single device. Before we begin uh, seeing how the tool is used, uh, I will first explain the precautions that need to be taken, uh, the system configuration that needs to be set up, and also how to start the system. Um, as far as the precautions are concerned, one of the important precautions we need to take is to make sure that the air AC is running so that the SMUs and any other tool that is uh, that can heat uh, remain cool. And the second precaution that we must take is to make sure that the vibration isolation table, the pump, the compressor that is connected to it, it must be turned on so that any vibrations that may um, from the surroundings will not affect the device, the probe devices, and the probe tips. I will now describe the, sy the system configuration. Uh, the, we will have two SMUs in the system. Uh, we can have third and fourth or how many of the SMUs we want uh, with the help of TSP links. Um, we, will, we also need a PC that will run the ACS software and we will need a PC that, is, that controls the probe station. Uh, the PC that controls the probe station is called the Velox PC and the one um, that and the Velox PC will have to be connected through a LAN cable to the PC that contains the ACS software. The Keithley GPIB controller uh, will have to be connected to the PC that contains the ACS software and will have to be connected to SMU1. Uh, the NI GPIB controller, which comes from the Velox PC, will be connected to SMU2. SMU1 and SMU2 will not only be connected by TSP links, but also via a GPIB interface. Uh, any other SMUs, SMU3 and 4, can be connected in the normal daisy chain manner to SMU through SMU2. Uh, this PC here, uh, as with the probe station, is the Velox PC that we were talking about. Uh, and the PC over there is the other one that contains the ACS software. The two SMUs uh, that have been labeled SMU1 and SMU2 are the ones that are connected to the Keithley GPIB controller and the NI uh, GPIB controller respectively. While starting the system, we need to turn on three main things in the system. One, the PC, the Velox PC and the uh, probe station to the microscope lamp, uh, which will Ill illuminate the dye that we are probing, and three, the PC and the SMUs. Uh, the PC that contains the ACS software and the SMUs that are linked to it. So the three parts of the system have been turned on. Uh, the Velox PC has been turned on, uh, the uh, vacuum pump has been turned on, and the microscope lamp has been turned on. The switches for the uh, probe station and the microscope lamp are present at the back. So after turning on the Velox PC, um, the probe station needs to be turned on. 
with the secondary switch that is present on the probe station. It is present on the right side of the probe station, which we can flip to turn the power on. Uh, since we are starting it up, we also need to press the reset button over here for it to really turn on. Uh, when we are starting the system, it, the, this particular window also automatically pops up, which asks to initialize the chuck stage of the probe station. When we click on OK, it moves the it moves the chuck and in initializes it to the correct coordinates. The initialization is done. However, if for any reason the initialization was not successful, we could go on go to the Velox taskbar above and click on initialization here and we can select which um, whether we want to perform x initialization or along the y direction z direction or the theta direction and click on start and it will reinitialize the chuck It is important to note that we will have to turn on the uh, probe station before we perform the initialization. We have another level of control to uh, manage the intensity of the microscope lamp, the light of the microscope lamp. Uh, with this control, we can turn it on. We have three important softwares in the Velox suit. One is the control center, which we will use to move around the chuck uh, in the x, y, and z directions. The wafer map, which we will use to create a map uh, and to locate every single co the coordinate of every single device that is present on the die. And spectrum, which we will use to see, uh, to see the die through the microscope. Uh, step one uh, is to load the die and uh, to make all the uh, adjustments and to orient the die correctly. Um, the first thing that we will do to, in order to do that is we will set the contact height. We will define the contact height um, and that can be defined by clicking this button here, right clicking this button going to edit and the contact height we will always define as 4000 micrometers and we will click on OK. These three buttons are now active. We will click on this button in order to move the chuck to the load position. This brings the chuck forward to a place where we can load the die. We can now open the front panel. And we see that the chuck has moved, moved forward. We will, so there is a grip that has been provided here, which we will move forward this way and we will pull the chuck out until it locks. Now we can load the die onto any of the three sites that are possible, either the chuck site or either of the auxiliary sites. I will be loading the die to the chuck site.
And in order to turn on the vacuum, to hold the die in place, we will click on the, the button next to the move chuck to load position die. We will switch on the chuck vacuum. And we see that it is now not easy to move the die around on the chuck. We will push this back in. until it locks in place and we will put this back. The front panel can now be closed. We will use the joystick present here in order to navigate on and see the structures on the die. So these are the structures that, that are present on the die and sometimes we observe that while manually loading the die, uh, it may not be properly oriented. The, since uh, each time we will be loading it manually, the, there is always a chance that it will be slightly tilted by at least a few degrees. So, we need, so one of the steps that we do right after loading the die is to perform an alignment on the same. So, in order to perform alignment, we can go to the spectrum software and click on the manual two point alignment button. We select the first point on, we select one point on a well-defined structure and we go along the same line and we select another point on what we know is present on the same line. So the die is now in focus, however, um, the micro the probe tips are at a very, are at a significant distance from the die. Uh, in order to uh, get the die closer to the probe tips, we will have to move this lever down. Uh, we can observe what is happening at the screen. And we see that as we move the microscope and the chuck upwards by pulling the lever downwards, the micro positioners come into focus. Since there is always a chance that the probe, the probe tips may not be visible from the microscope and may not be present directly under the microscope, um, there is a chance that while moving the lever down, there may, uh, the probe tips may collide with the die. So we need to ensure that the, while starting off, the probe tips are at a significant height from the die so that even when we move the lever down, it does not cause any damage when, when it comes closer to the die. The micro positioners, uh, the probe tips that we see on the screen are attached to this micro positioner here and the micro positioner at the back over there. Uh, each micro positioner has three knobs present on it with which we can control the X, Y and Z movements of the probes. The, to move the probe up or down, we can use the knob on top and we can see the movement in the Z direction over there uh, because the probe is moving more out of focus and into focus as we move it up and down. Using the knob at the back, we can use, we can move the probe forward and backward. And using the knob on the left of the micro positioner, we can use it to move the probe left and right. I will double click at the edge of the very first structure in order to move the center of the spectrum software uh, to the edge. We next need to go to the control center 
the home button, right click on it and set it to current position. Doing so will set whatever point we had selected in the spectrum software to be the home position. So if we move to any other point on the die and we press move to home position, it gets us back to the same position. It is important to note that I have chosen the same points on all eight devices in order to create the map. Um, after having uh, saved each of these locations, I will go to file on the wafer map software, the maps sub option and click on save as. We will save this map as a dot map file after giving it an appropriate name. We will also have to save the same in the dot stv format. So we move, we go to files, sub dice and save as. I will save it under the same name. and I will save it as a table view file or a .stv file. The .map file can be recalled at any point on the same software when required on another occasion uh, for a different die of the same layout. Um, the .stv file though we will use to transfer it to the ACS software. Uh, the ACS software does not identify the .map file, uh, however it does um, support CSV files and it is far more easier to convert the STV file that we have created on the wafer map software into a CSV file than it is to convert the .map file into a CSV file. Before we move on to actually ma making the map of the devices that are present on the die, we need to follow a few additional steps. Uh, so the first step, we will go to the setup tab in the wafer map software and under coordinates, we will we can observe that the 00, zero die uh, has been selected as this one. This is 102030. Zero, and this is 010203. We will move, we will set the 00, zero die to somewhere near the chuck center. To, in order to do that, we will select this origin selection and we will select a die of ours choosing. And we will orient the positive x and y directions. Uh, we will orient the positive x direction in this way and the positive y direction in this way. In order to do that, we can select origin at lower left. These steps would be important uh, in the case where we have multiple dies that are present on the same wafer. The next step is to select the, is to set the reference. To set the reference, we will select the set reference button on the top and we will select the 00, zero die. We will also right click on the same and we will select chuck position from reference. We are now ready to create the wafer map. Uh, the 00, zero position is always what is the same coordinates as of whatever we've set as home. To add more points, we will move to the desired point that we want to add to the map. On the spectrum software. And once we're happy with, this, with the coordinate that we've selected, we move to the wafer map software 
and in the sub dies tab, we click on the plus icon and a new position is added. Similarly, if we want to add a third position, we can do so and we can continue this for all the devices that are meant to be probed on a given die. I will make a map of eight devices for the time being. So these eight devices have now been added to the map. After creating the dot map in the dot stv files on the Velox PC, we have transferred the dot stv file onto the PC that has the ACS software. Uh, here we will convert the dot stv file into a dot csv file. Um, in order to view an stv file, we need Microsoft Excel and I've used the same to open the dot stv file. We observe that in this file, there are five rows of headers which we do not need in the final CSV file. So I will be deleting these rows. The die origin uh, has, is, which is zero, zero, can also be set. We see that in each of the cells of the first column, there are two values separated by commas. Instead, we will split the, we will split these two values over two rows. In order to do that, I will select the first column, go to data, and under the text to columns option, I will select delimited, go to next, select comma here, select on next, and finish. So the same data which was present in the in one single column has now been split into uh, and has been put into two columns. It is important to note it is important to note that the wafer map software and the ACS software do not recognize coordinates in the same format. To feed the coordinates that we have obtained from the wafer map software into ACS we need to scale the numbers by a factor of minus one by 1000. So the numbers that we see here, that we have obtained from the STV file from the wafer map software, needs to be multiplied by minus one by 1000. And this needs to be done for all points and all coordinates. We will paste only the values in the next few columns. Values only. And we will delete the first four columns. And these are the, this is the, these are the coordinates that can be fed to the ACS software and have it recognized properly. We will save this file in the CSV format as we originally intended. Here we will select CSV, comma delimited, and we will save it under the same name, and click on save. So we can turn on the ACS software and we can load the CSV file that we have created, which contains the coordinates of every point of the um, wafer map that we have created. Uh, before that, we can turn on the SMUs. Um, we will turn on the SMU2 first and then the SMU1.
and we will open the ACS software in the meanwhile. It is important to note that the ACS software um, for, uh, semi, uh, for the automation purposes requires a standard license, not the basic license. So it must be ensured that while running ACS, we have connected the standard license key. I have now created a new pattern, a subsite, device, and a test. I have defined the test uh, to sweep from minus 3 volts to 3 volts in steps of 0 0.3, and the other one, and the other one kept it to 0 with compliance values of 100 nanoamperes. Uh, but before we proceed any further for the automation, uh, we need to load the CSV file that we have created. To do so, I have selected the subsite here and this icon here on the right side which says import, import subsite list from .csv file, I will click on the same. I will move to, I will select the file that we created, the .csv file, and I will click on open. The eight subsites that we had defined are now loaded. The next step is to go to this probe control tab on the left. We will be using the options present in this tab to navigate and control the semi-automatic probe station from the ACS software. I have now created a new pattern, a subsite, device, and a test. I have defined the test uh, to sweep from minus 3 volts to 3 volts in steps of 0 0.3 and the other one, and the other one kept it to zero with compliance values of 100 nanoamperes. Uh, but before we proceed any further for the automation, uh, we need to load the CSV file that we have created. To do so, I have selected the subsite here and this icon here on the right side which says import import subsite lists from .csv file, I will click on the same. I will move to, I will select the file that we created, the .csv file and I will click on open. The eight subsites that we had defined are now loaded. The next step is to go to this probe control tab on the left. We will be using the options present in this tab to navigate and control the semi-automatic probe station from the ACS software. Um, the Velox PC and the PC that contains the ACS software are able to communicate because of the LAN cable. Uh, however, to initialize the software, uh, through software, we will have to right click on the Velox tab above, click on GPIB. So we will now probe the devices. We will probe the very first device which we have selected on the wafer map.
and I will select other subsites. So by double clicking any other subsite in the sub subdise um, section of the wafer map software, it moves the center to that device. So we can check whether we are probing all the devices correctly by moving to other devices. Clearly it is seen that um, all the devices are being probed correctly even when we move from one device to another. We will now, we will now probe the uh, device. Sorry? Yeah. It slides, huh? Yes. Um, uh, uh, huh. We can also see that we can move the chuck, chuck up and down with the help of this button present here. Next, we can go on to the automation tab. Here, we can mention the wafer ID while saving the f output files from r after running the tests, it will save it with the wafer ID as an identification. Next, we can go to the data tab here and we can select automatically save to CSV file after each wafer and parameter and column. Checking parameter and column uh, gives the name of the parameter, uh, that is the current or the voltage or any other parameter that we've set as the he header of the column and, it, and selecting automatically save to CSV after each wafer. So after the completion of each wafer, it saves uh, all the test data that it has obtained into one CSV file. So upon running the uh, upon running the test, um, we see that after performing each measurement, it moves to the next site, it moves to the next device as defined and runs the test there again. So when we run the test, we notice that the first device gets probed. And upon completion of the uh, test, it moves on to the next device and it completes all the devices that were present within the map. So after all the devices that are present in the wafer map have been probed and measured, uh, a test complete message appears. After clicking on OK, if we navigated to the project name, uh, and went to data, we would be able to find the test yeah. in the name of the user. If we went to the CSV folder, we would be able to find the test data in a folder that is identified by the wafer ID that we had given.
So these are the voltages that were applied and the currents that were measured in response. And we can process this data further uh, in any programming language of our choice. Now that the measurements are complete, we will unload the die. Uh, before doing that, we will first unprobe the device. And move the probes as far apart as possible. We will lift the lever up. And we can close the wafer map software. In the control center, we can click this button to move the chuck to the lowered position. We will now open the front panel. And pull the chuck out. And lock it in place. We will turn off the vacuum. Uh, the button that has been highlighted there. And we will remove the die from the chuck. We will have to push the chuck back into place. Close the front panel. And move it to center position. We can turn off the power button for the, micro uh, for the probe station. And we can shut, this, uh, sh shut down the Velox PC. In the meanwhile, uh, after we've made sure that we've got save, saved the data, we can close the ACS software as well. And we can shut down the computer. It is important to turn off the microscope lamp from here as well as from the mains that is present at the back. We will also have to turn off the vacuum pump from the switch, from the ma manual switch that is present there, as well as the switch that we've, we use to turn on the uh, Velox PC and the semi-automatic probe station. Greetings. Uh, today I will be explaining the RF characterization setup that we have in ANCF. And uh, part of the setup is, of course, the Cascade Microtech Summit 12000 uh, semi-automatic probe station. Uh, we have uh, the Keithley 4200 uh, parameter analyzer. And also a part of the setup is the WinCal software, which will be run on a separate PC. Uh, there are many other accessories that are part of this setup, like the GSG probe tips and the 1.8 mm um, connector cables, SME cables. and BIOSTs, which are used to combine the DC and the RF signals together. So as a part of the hardware configuration, uh, we have the PC, which contains the calibration software, WinCal, connected to the PC, which is used for controlling the semi-automatic probe station, the Velox PC. Uh, both of them are connected through a LAN cable. Um, not only that, the VNA that is present at the Greetings. Today I'll be demonstrating the RF setup that we have at ANCF to characterize uh, devices at um, frequencies up to 67 gigahertz. Uh, part of the setup includes the 
Cascade Microtech Summit 12,000 semi-automatic probe station. It includes the 4200 uh, parameter analyzer um, from Keithley. Uh, we also have a Keysight VNA, which is present behind the setup, whose display can be seen over here. And we also have a separate PC that contains a calibration software that is used to calibrate uh, before performing any measurements. Uh, as, a, as a part of the hardware configuration, uh, the PC that contains the calibration software, WinCal, is connected to the Velox PC, which, con which controls the semi-automatic probe station uh, through a LAN cable. Apart from that, the PC that contains WinCal is also connected to a VNA through another LAN cable. So these are the RF probe micropositioners. And this is the 1.8 mm connector cable that is coming from the BIST, which is in turn connected to the VNA and the SMU. The output of the cable is connected to these probes, the ones that we see in blue. Those are GSG probes, meaning that they have uh, two grounds and one signal in between. And we will not be using these DC micropositioners for these measurements. The DC output of the SMU is connected to the bias T, as shown earlier. Uh, typically, we, we use SMU1 for uh, the gate and SMU6 uh, for the drain, uh, port 1 for the gate and port 2 for the drain. That is the convention that we have been following in the lab. Uh, you, uh, however, uh, if we were to change it, the test setup that we have would also have to change with it. Uh, so also we, we see that we are connecting the chuck bias to force low of SMU1, or else it could be connected to another SMU and zero volts could be applied to it. So what we can see here is the port of the VNA, the output port of the VNA. And this is the output port of the VNA. This is port number one. And there is another port present on the VNA, port two. Uh, the model of the VNA that we have in the lab is the Keysight PNAX N5247A. And it can go up to a frequency of 67 gigahertz. Uh, this is a two port single source VNA. So it has two such ports present uh, on the front panel. Uh, connected to the port is a bias T, which takes the uh, RF input from the RF output of the VNA and the DC input from an SMU and combines both of them and gives it out on this 1.8 mm cable which then goes to the probe. So we have two such bias T's, two such 1.8 mm cables, and two such SME cables, which are connected to the uh, 4200. The software that we're using for um, performing the RF characterization, one, we're going to be using Clarius that is present in 4200. We're going to be using WinCal on a separate PC. We will be using the control center and the spectrum vision um, software f uh, from the Velox PC. And we're going to be using the inbuilt um, S parameter analyzer f that is present in the uh, VNA. So uh, the steps to start the system have already been discussed previously in the semi-automatic probe station video uh, and about uh, the video in which we discuss how to use the semi-automatic feature of the tool. Um, how, so we will start off with loading the die as the first step. Um, the, apart from loading the die at the center of the chuck, we will also have to load in an, uh, another die, which is known as the calibration substrate, which contains all the stand, um, which contains structures such as open shorts and throughs whose um, parameters and whose characteristics are previously d known. And we will be using that to remove the uh, effects of the cables and any other parasitics that are not required.
but are inherently a part of the system. In the demo on the semi-automatic feature of the probe station, we have already seen how to start the system and how to initialize the system. Uh, so we will not be covering that in this demo. However, we will directly start off with loading the die. Apart from loading the die that has to be characterized, we also will have to load another die that is known as the calibration substrate. The calibration substrate contains standards of known characteristics, uh, standards such as opens, shorts, throughs, and loads, whose uh, resistance, whose um, reflection at different frequencies, uh, all characteristics are known beforehand. Uh, probing such devices and seeing the difference between the expected output and the real output that we get in the system, uh, we can correct for the unwanted effects of the cables, the losses of other parts of the system uh, that are inherent and cannot be done away with. So this process is known as calibration and the calibration substrate is used for it. So we have loaded both the die as well as the calibration substrate onto the chuck. The die has been loaded on the chuck site. The calibration substrate has been loaded on an auxiliary site. The calibration substrate that we are using is also made by Cascade Microtech. It is the ISS 101190 calibration substrate. So um, we can so now that we have placed the dice on the chuck site and in the auxiliary site, we can turn the vacuum on for the chuck site through the control ce center software, this button that we see over here. And to turn the vacuum on at the auxiliary site, we have been pr the provided with a mechanical switch 